Hello and welcome to this edition of Biting Talk with Life Kitchens, presented by me, William Sitwell, Telegraph restaurant critic and food writer. Biting Talk is Britain's liveliest food and drink podcast, and it brings you an enviable, unrivaled, and I dare say delicious array of culinary talent from food and drink innovators to chefs, writers, and much more. Biting Talk comes to you in association with Life Kitchens, and they are people who create kitchens to be lived in, that are planned around your life and the way you live it. So you can explore their unique ranges and book a design consultation for a personal and practical approach to kitchens. Now, on this episode, we tackle an area of hospitality that I've neglected, nightclubs. We'll hear from London nightclub boss Carlo Corello, and I'll be asking him if he feels the neglect, what the future is for his business, and indeed, whether making a case for late nights, carousing and bad dancing is legitimate in these days of continuing crisis. Then we'll meet a woman whose entire life has been entrenched with Indian food. As the London restaurant Chutney Mary approaches its 30th birthday, I'll be chatting with its co-founder, Camellia Punjabi. Then we remember the late and truly great Sir Terence Conran with his friend, enemy, collaborator and tormentor, Stephen Bailey. He's the design consultant and writer who worked with Conran over many years and who will muse with me on the legacy of Sir Terence. After that, we'll meet Charlie Bigham, a man who no one had heard of until he put his name on a supermarket meal 24 years later, and he runs a very successful, highly recognisable food brand. I wonder which of his meal ideas he thought would be great, but turned out to be turkeys. And we'll round off the show with the biting talk mixologist Farhad Haydari. This week, he's mixing a gin spider highball, whatever the hell that is. But first, we welcome the man behind bougies and raffles, the nightclub man who enticed royalty into his nightclubs, but who, I imagine, has been having rather a lot of early nights more recently. Carla Corello, welcome to Biting Talk. Good evening, William. How are you? Very good to see you. Lovely to see you. Now, as I was saying um, in my intro, the whole business of nightclubs seems to have been absent from the, the national dialogue. We've talked all about hospitality. We, we've had eat out to help out. No one has ever even mooted the idea of going out to help the nightclub business. Um, some may think that nightclubs are not an, an intrinsic part of our culture. Obviously, it's an intrinsic part of what you do because it's what you do for a living. Have, have you and your colleagues within the nightclub industry felt neglected um, yes, as a matter of fact, um, the communication from the government has been non-existent. Um, nightclubs and late night bars employ over a million people, mostly the young in the United Kingdom. Overall, the hospitality sector in the UK contributes £150 billion per annum. Clubs and late night bars themselves contribute £66 billion to the UK economy. Um, we haven't traded since March. Um, and we're paying rent, utilities, service contracts, and bigger, biggest of all, we're, we're paying furlough contributions of 10% plus NI, so that equates to 23.5% this month, going up to 33.5% next month with NI and, and the 20% combined. And that, it's madness when, we, when we're told we cannot trade. Other, the, other industries can trade, they have flexible furlough. We, we can't open our doors. Um, I think London as a whole has also been neglected when it comes to the late night sector. The grant by the government um, is only up to rateable values of £51,000. Um, most clubs and late night bars have much higher rates than that. Um, I, and the hard part is, and it, it's a question that's the question for now, is we have no idea we can re when we can reopen. And... Do we keep the staff on furlough going into October, costing us 33 and a half? Many businesses can't, and I'm not sure we can. You mentioned this key part of the tax take. So financially, you say it's important. But, you know, would you say, however, that, you know, do you feel that the fr are you, do you feel that you're at the fringes of culture because you've been ignored? Because people might say that hospitality, restaurants, as I've written, are at a, are at a cornerstone of, of our culture. But um, where do nightclubs factor there? I mean, I get what you say about employment and tax take and so on. It's one of the reasons you've been neglected. Is be pe it's because people think that, you know, nightclubs are a frivolous part of culture. Yes, but they also have their benefits. People need to let off steam. People need to have fun. 
yes, there are, there's a stigma that nightclubs are bad, but you could also say that about, about football, about who, about the, the minor 1% of British hooligans, et cetera. Um, but it's a very small amount. Overall, people go, they have fun, they enjoy themselves, and, and soon they may not be able to with the fact that businesses will go under. The question is, right now, William, the biggest issue for us um, is, do we make everyone redundant at the end of this month because we have zero communication from the government? Okay. Um, obviously, the rule of six holds almost no prospect because the whole point of a, you know, one can see that, uh, you know, in a restaurant, you can have tables of six and four and two, a nightclub. Can you really operate? Could you, could you operate? Could you open and, and attempt to operate where you have little pockets of six people only dancing? Is there a way that you could actually have some bravado and some courage and operate? Or are you simply told you can't open? So firstly, to answer that question, dancing is not allowed. Um, everyone, a table of six, everyone has to have a seat. Um, we've looked at it. We've, uh, we've been discussing it thoroughly between our partners and I to try and make the venue COVID friendly. So let me just stop you there. So because I don't know the legislation, I haven't read it. There is actual... Uh, wording within the government's websites and within their laws where they say dancing is not allowed. Is that right? Correct. Dancing is not allowed and neither is loud music because it encourages people to sing and therefore could spread more of a virus. But remember, my lawyer was telling me today that in her team, they can eat, all have, a, all have um, a bite to eat in their boardroom of a 12 person team, but they can't go out for lunch. So it's, in my view, the messaging is very mixed. And, it, and for us, there's no messaging at all. OK, you say no, no messaging at all. Um, are you making attempts to, you know, is there a group of nightclub bosses such as yourself? Do you gather? Have you lobbied government? Is there a channel of communication? Do you try and find out from the government, you know, what you can do or what's happening? Yes, there was a, the, night, the head of, light, um, of the hospitality sector in the nighttime industry met with, a gov with uh, various people from the government last week. Very little came of it. Um, on a personal note, um, I'm meeting with the MP for Kensington and Chelsea and Hammersmith and Fulham, Greg Hands, next Friday. Because again, we haven't heard much from him either. OK, OK. So very few, very little cha channels of communication. Your MPs aren't telling you anything what have you been doing personally, first of all? Um, you know, if you can't operate a nightclub, I expect you've been um, sleeping, uh, you know, the, the normal hours that us civilians sleep. How, have you, how has it changed your life personally? Um, the work's still there. I mean, we've got to make sure all the further applications will be at right HR stuff. I mean, it's also a time of action. We need to make sure that, that there are service contracts to reduce our break even of our, um, to reduce our break even the best way possible but also on a personal level it's been it's been time for family it's been time um, we had a wonderful weekend in Suffolk together um, um, but it's been a time to reflect it's also been a time to look at new things raffles did a pop-up recently um, uh, raffles did a pop-up in an external venue um, for six weeks um, the appetite is there the appetite for people to go out is there. Um, and, and the truth of the matter is, this would all make sense if people followed direction. But especially speaking about the young, they've given up on COVID. They want to get on with their lives. Um, let's go back. How did you yourself get into uh, the nightclub business? Because, um, you know, it seems like a bit of a, you know, a loose avenue for a young man. Did you, did you see it as a, as a serious financial uh, you know, p pursuit for an entrepreneur, or did you did you go into it because you just wanted to have a good time? So I've been in the nightclub business since I was sixteen. Um, my, <laughs> my parents gave me very little pocket money, and and I was upset by that. So my best friend uh, and I decided um, on weekends out from school we would we would fill venues and charge everyone to get in, and we were we were doing very well those days. I mean, we were going back to school with wads of cash. So and then I fell in love with it. But it also nearly killed me. <laughs> right. And um, bougies, those heady days where you managed to entice, um, you know, the, the young royals and the, the glitterati of high society. Um, you say that uh, that they were heady days. 
um, I expect it was quite difficult not to join in with a party. The matter of fact is, I, I very much joined in with a party. I'm now, uh, I, I'm now a sober nightclub owner. I burnt the candle too much at both ends. And, and how did you entice all those young royals into your club? Was that just personal contacts or uh, were you in the right place at the right time? Um, it was a bit of both, to be honest. Um, it was a bit of both. Um, our, company, our company motto between myself and my business partners is, and apologies to say it, is to treat our customers like fucking rock stars. So, um, so we've always focused on getting the right people in, uh, the right people in, providing an amazing service and having the right team. We've got people, and, it, and this is where it deeply saddens me, we've got people working at Raffles who've worked with myself, Jake, Fraser and Hamish for over 13, 14 years. So at the moment, um, do you see any silver linings or is, at the moment is it literally, you know, the nightclub business doesn't seem to have a future because there's no, not even a tantalising prospect of it? The silver lining I see is Sweden uh, becoming, a, uh, becoming a venue, that you, uh, a country which now you don't have to quarantine from. You'll take raffles to Sweden? <laughs> I wish. Uh, no, it's more of a fact of acceptance and whether or not we can accept like we do with the flu, that what's going on nowadays is a part of life for now. Um, to, as I say, it's one of our biggest sectors. I mean, can you imagine that, can you imagine if we went through what Belgium did and started closing hospitality at 10 p.m.? Or some suggestions say nine. At 9 p.m., much of a restaurant scene will also be going under. It's a terrible time for hospitality, not just nightclubs but for many operators. Okay. Well, listen, Carla, we must end it there. Thank you so much. Thank you, William. Have a lovely, lovely evening. It's time to meet my next guest, Camelia Panjabi, restaurateur, co-founder of Chutney Mary 30 years ago. Camelia, welcome to Biting Talk. Lovely to meet you. Can you believe it? 30 years since the launch of Chutney Mary... Has the time flown by? Absolutely. It's unbelievable. It was just a little while ago that Chutney Mary began. I saw a copy of a menu from 30 years ago. Um, this, was the f this was the world's first Anglo-Indian restaurant. Um, when you look at the menu and you see things like curried mango and yogurt soup, um, can you really believe that you did a dish like that? Or is that a dish unique spicy and sour soup inspired by the fresh mango curries of Western India. Do, do you cringe at dishes like that or do you still feel it was a wonderful thing to introduce to the British dining public? No, I think it's a great dish and it is um, an authentic dish. The mango curry of Gujarat is called Fajeta and it's celebrated even now during the mango season. And it was just the right thing to do. And in terms of Anglo-Indian, because that's not something you hear about now, um, when you launched that restaurant, people might have thought it seemed quite old fashioned because it you know, harks back to the era of colonialism when you know, British uh, and Indian army officers were, were, were you know, working together and the Indian food was possibly too spicy for the British palate, so compromises were made. Um, when you launched a restaurant as an Anglo-Indian restaurant, in the 90s, did it feel a little old fashioned to you at the time or did you feel it was an exciting new trend that you could introduce to London diners? Well, it wasn't a trend. It's always bothered me that we are ready in India and in the rest of the world to celebrate Indian cuisine based on the Mughals, the Mughlai food. The Mughals ruled India for maybe 150 or 200 years. And that was already more than 250 years ago. So we are ready to celebrate the fusion of what the Mongols brought to India and how it wove together. The same thing happened with the English who were there for 150 years. And the food did become something different from what it was before they came. And yet we're not ready to acknowledge that. And um, so it was very, it was very apt. It's actually what I ate in my childhood. It's what urban India ate. And it's very much there. And it led to a revival of Anglo-Indian food even in India. 25 or 30 years later, 
Anglo Indian restaurants have set up in India. I mentioned at the top of the show about this idea of I often speak to chefs and they sort of say, um, and Adam Handings, an, an example actually, I was speaking to him recently, he gave an interview and he said that British food 10 years ago was an embarrassment. So that's 2010. People often celebrate the, the wonders of modern food. Um, but of course, you've been in the business for some time. Um, 30 years ago, people celebrated your restaurant. You've seen the development of Indian food. When people look back in time and think of Indian food in the 70s and the 80s of, as being an embarrassment, do you think that's a nonsense? Or do you think that we really have come to a completely new and exciting era where we are today? Well, I think uh, the evolution of Indian food in Britain really began to change from the curry house culture in the early 1980s uh, with the Bombay Brasserie. And then 1990, Chutney Mary was a milestone. It then sets the trend for good Indian chefs to leave India and come and settle in England. And so another stream of non-Bangladeshi dominated Indian cuisine evolved. And I think in the last 10 or 15 years, that has really uh, come to a level where I would say that in some of the Indian restaurants in Britain, the food is far better than you would find in an Indian restaurant in India. And perhaps it's the only cuisine in the world where that can be said of a cuisine compared to its parent country. Because, because possibly you've taken all the best chefs. <laughs> you've, you've brought them all over to London. Well, I must say that we did bring really good chefs and so have the others. But the chefs also have to evolve based on what's happening around them and most importantly, by customer feedback. A chef can only cater to happy customers and if the customers are not takers and not adventurous uh, and acceptance of change, then uh, that cuisine cannot thrive. And it, I imagine it must tickle you also that one of the key things that you were doing at Chutney Mary all those years ago was plated food um, for people who hated sharing because, of course, Indian food is a, like a lot of other food cultures, you know, uh, it's food for sharing. Chutney Mary was very much plated. Now, of course, 30 years later, we're all sharing again. That must, you, you must look at that with a fair amount of wit and amusement. Well, you know, one has to um, one has to evolve cuisine always to the country where the cuisine is being served. And in the West and in England, people don't like necessarily to have a collection of things. They somebody would say, "I want fresh seafood," and somebody will say, "I want a vegetarian meal." And another customer will say, well, you know, I really like my food spicy so they can choose a spicy dish. So this sharing means you come to a kind of low common denominator, which is acceptable to the whole table. And so um, it was only natural that one had to uh, evolve the cuisine to suit individual preference. Now, one of your great achievements is your cookbook. Uh, translated into seven languages, 1.25 million copies sold, um, the 50 great curries of India. Of all the 50, what, what is Camellia Punjabi's favourite, if you could pick one? If I could pick one, it would be the chicken do piazza from Bengal, because it was uh, shown to me by the uh, sort of greatest gourmet in Calcutta. He lived 30 miles away from the city in a big traditional mansion home. And every weekend he cooked himself. And this was his prized recipe. And I think it's absolutely fantastic. And of those seven languages, are there, is there a country, a nation that um, has sold that book well that surprised you that you might not have thought that Indian cuisine would, would really resonate? Yes, several editions of uh, my cookbook in Sweden, Norway, uh, Netherlands, and Germany. I didn't expect that. 
it's wonderful to uh, catch up with you. Uh, I, I recommend anyone, if they can get hold of your menu from 30 years ago, it's a beautiful thing. It reflects the uh, the spirit of the restaurant. I remember it all those years ago with the, you know, your the tropical decoration and the those cane chairs. Thank you, William. And we'd like to invite you to Chutney Mary. I'll be there. In the current address. Thank you. In St. James's. Exactly. Thank you so much. Uh, right, there we go. Camilla Panjabi. Stephen Bailey, welcome to Biting Talk. Uh, it's it's very good to be bitten. <laughs> it's very good to hear your fantastic voice. Um, now, Stephen, we're going to talk about the late, great Sir Terence Conran. And just first of all, just for those who might not understand the intricacies of your relationship, tell us about your friendship with him and how far your various collaborations sort of stretch back to? Well, I've known him for um, nearly 40 years. Um, I met him first when I was editing the the, the 1977 Jubilee edition of the Architectural Review. Um, I was doing that because I was, my birth was a product of the uh, Jubilee euphoria in um, 1951. Um, and I wanted to, uh, and my this, this Jubilee edition of the Architectural Review was all about life in Britain, you know, um, post 1951. And I'd always want, and, and Terence Conran, I think, was an essential part of that. Very few people have made a better contribution to culture, material culture in Britain than Terence. So I went to meet him for the Architectural Review. That was the first time I met him. And then, um, and then, um, then subsequently, um, about two years later. Um, I was writing a book about design, which was unbelievably. It was one of the uh, one of the first books on the subject, which took the which which, which we, there were books about the Bauhaus and William Morris before, but very few books about everyday design. Terence sort of discovered what I was doing, plucked me from the obscurity of the provincial museum where I where a provincial university where I worked, and um, you know with his with his sort of typical thing, come come hither finger says you know come and join me. So I had a a sort of I had a sort of you know like a Robert Frost poem. You know, there were two paths in the forest. I could either stay in my academic career, which probably wasn't very promising, or I could go and join Terence to help him, as he said, promote design. And the way we the way we promoted design, we took over a space in the Victorian Albert Museum, uh, which became known as the Boiler House Project. In the eighties, we put on twenty six different exhibitions about design there. Um, which helped make design the popular subject is today, and then that was that all led up to the opening of the uh, Design Museum in Butler's Wharf in 1989, of which I was the founding director. And that's it, really. And since then, Terence and I have written a couple of books together, and we've been he's been simultaneously my patron, my mentor, my friend, my antagonist, and you know my friend again, and latterly an antagonist. But he was a remarkable man. As I say, very few people have made made a more positive contribution to material life in this country in recent years. So just thinking about that, because people often talk about you know, they, you know, people die and they say, oh, this is the person that changed this or changed the way we ate, changed the way that we, we felt, changed the way we lived. Because of the, he had so many fingers in the pies of actual living in terms of from a almost a cushion to a chair to a bed to what you put in your mouth. I suppose, you know, he really did have an an actual, you know, he really did change. But what what specifically, what are, what are those things that you would put your finger on? Well, I wouldn't say. I mean, I mean, I think I think fond of, fond fond of and respectful of as I am of Terence, and I have frankly few people who've done done more than me to promote, you know, to promote Terence as a as a you know as a as a representative of the values which I also I you know uh, possess. That's namely that everyday things are very important, and that you know that art is not just one percent of life. Art should be you know the experience of art, the experience of beauty, uh, should be part of everyday life. Um, what did Terence? But having said that, I think it's, it is possible to overestimate Terence's personal influence. He was one of many people doing. So uh, doing similar things, he was, he was he was a product of the zeitgeist, as we all are. It's just that Terence was more adroit, more adept, more savvy than uh, uh, than most of the other people engaged in the same sort of thing. I mean, for instance, about just about for, I mean, uh, you know, 1964, Terence opened his habitat shop, but before that, in '53, he'd opened the first thing, which we call a, bi- a bistro. Um, but it's, as I said, Terence was just—he he was always had a sort of love. Uh, you know, he's been in love with the media all his all his life, and he was better able to exploit those media connections uh, than almost anybody else. If you look at, if you actually look at David Gentleman's illustrations for uh, uh, Patience Gray and Rose Boyd's book *Plat du Jour*, which was published in 1957, one of the first books post Elizabeth David to make you know sort of bistro style cooking um, available to everybody, <laughs> David Gentleman's illustrations. 
actually predict habitat, if you like. There's the, all the crockery and the tableware and the and all the stuff which we associate with habitat. It was actually had actually been published in influential cookbooks before. Um, not least in Elizabeth David and John Minton's illustrations to uh, Terence was a great Francophile, but John Minton, uh, who illustrated Elizabeth David's uh, Mediterranean food, they, he got there first. But what Terence was, Terence was a great exploiter of things. I said that in the, in the, without hoping any, any lack of generosity. He was an inspire, inspiring person, but he was also an inspired one. He was very good at taking a cue from other people, a, a very adroit spotter of ideas and a very clever integrator of things. And, and I think if you wanted me to explain in, in, in just in one sentence what his why we're why we're talking about him on you know on um, you know on, um, on on biting biting talk is that you know Elizabeth David taught uh, anybody who was interested that it was very important to know how to make ratatouille, uh, but Terence took that a step further. He said, if you want to make ratatouille, I can sell you. Uh, the kitchen and the kitchen equipment in which you'd want to make it. You know, the Provencal cookware, the all the stuff, a moolie. There are stories from when Habitat first opened in 1964 <coughs> of Terence showing a moolie, you know, a food mill, uh, to members of staff, and they had no idea what it was. I mean, Terence didn't introduce the moolie. Uh, I mean, other people knew about it, but he was the one who sort of popularised it. The same with baguettes, pâté, soup, chicken stock, the duvet. Uh, I, mean, I mean, these weren't inventions of Terence, but he was a very, very astute popularizer of them. Yes, and and, I, and then he collated. So he he was an he was an editor, I suppose, if you like. Well, I think I've always thought he was an editor of merchandise, yes. which is what he what he was. He wasn't a great. I mean, you know, if you Google designer, Terence yeah. Conran probably comes top of the in the top of the search list. But actually, Terence wasn't a particularly talented designer. He got he designed this and that. Um, but yeah, he, he was not a, he was not an original creative genius in that sense. But he was a great integrator, a great uh, I mean, a great observer. Yes. And to put it another way, is Terence 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 had two perceptions of absolute genius. Um, one was that um, design uh, design was no longer a word which no longer describes an activity like throwing a pot or whittling a stick. Uh, design, in his view, he made it into a commodity which you could buy. And when you bought it, you became socially promoted. You were better off, uh, you know, artistically, emotionally, and and socially. And his second stroke of genius was to realise in the 1960s that there was a new generation of people coming out of the new universities, you know, the concrete, not the red brick universities, the concrete and glass universities, who, in the, as the saying goes, had to buy their own furniture. And he was the person to, um, you know, to, to he, supply that. So he enabled it. Now, you, you mentioned at the top of our chat about that relationship and it was a complicated one it was a tricky one i mean i i described you in the telegraph as his frenemy and i and you certainly did seem to have feuds public private possibly as well i would i would imagine so now that he's dead given the fact that he was this collaborator friend you fell out with him personally how does how does that make you feel had you settled things at the end or were you in the middle of a feud well, no, 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 no. I hadn't spoken to him in a few years. We typically were having we were having um, a, a legal dispute. Not the first, not the first one we've had. But you know, I, I think he, you know, uh, we never actually had a, a violently fell out. We just had a sort of fractious relationship, which ended up in in, in long silences uh, for a period. Well, you know, I think what particularly, I mean, you know, I think to be honest, without trying to flatter myself too much, Terence saw in me a mirror image of himself. He was constantly uh, when I worked directly with him he was constantly criticizing me for not being able to concentrate and being too much of liberty gibbets and just getting never you know never never doing anything properly moving on to the next thing all the time that's exactly what he was like i mean no one history history can't decide really whether terence was you know, restlessly creative or just incapable of concentrating um i think i think it was a you know slightly the you know slightly the, the two things but actually what I, I i think if you speak to any of terence's collaborators um the one thing they'd all which all you'd find admiration was almost universal for his good points. And I've seen the very best of Terence and the very worst of him, the very worst of him, the very best of him. He was a man of great charm, great talent, humour, wit, and occasional generosity. Well, this charm had an on-off switch, which was quite sensitive. Uh, that was the best of him. But the, but the worst of him was a, was a, was a, was a, a centre stage grabbing, rather selfish, rather greedy curmudgeon who refused to give other people credit for things. And that, and that was always the basis of our, of our, of our, you know, of, of the friction between us. Because actually, we agreed on everything else. I mean, our value, in mean, the larger sense of things, our value system, um, you know, it, it was identical. And d does it sadden you that that he died during a feuding moment of of silence between, or would you would you have liked to have 
you know, made up with him? How, how are you sanguine about it? You know, we had a couple of, you know, in, the, in the past few years, we've had a couple of slight, um, you know, contacts. And, I, and he, it's just very typical of Terence to, you know, to, you know, to keep a feud, uh, to keep a feud going. Um, which is fine. Well, possibly, yeah, very possibly, very possibly, yes. But you know, he knows. I think there was no, there was no fundamental loss of affection of respect between between us and anything. He was just Terence felt I was being an annoying little, you know, I, I was being an annoying little prick, and I and I thought Terence was being an, you know, an, an ungrateful old curmudgeon. But it's like, you no, know, it's been like that forever. And tell me, I, th- there was a book I gather you wrote, a biography of his, and that was the basis of this legal dispute, um, if I'm not wrong. Now that he's uh, passed away, will that book be published? What's happening with that? Well, I think, I think, I think it will. You'd have to, you, you'd have to have more influence with my agent and publish than I've got to get, a, to get an answer for that. But yes, um, I, um, I hope, it, I hope it will. The book I should explain is a, it's a, it's, a, it's a, not a formal biography. It's a. It's a very informal memoir, um, you know, portrait of someone I knew and respected a lot. Uh, and uh, Terence saw it, and of course he got terribly cross because I, uh, I mean, Terence has exist. Terence, as I said, he's had a love affair with the media forever, and he's very good at cajoling and stroking journalists to get good stories. He understands. I mean, I mean Terence was a, put it this way: Terence was a great print media influencer, um, and great good for him. I mean, it would work. It worked a treat for you know for his business and for everybody and and, and for the rest of the rest of the British population. And and can I ask what were the specifics, or is that uh, still? Yeah. Well, I just think I, I just think well, you can. I believe it's too boring to give you the details, but just the sense was I, I was prepared to tell, um, uh, you know, give a give a rounded portrait of, of of the man. I mean, Terence was enigmatic and fascinating, but extraordinarily difficult as well. But then, you know, saints, um, you know, saints are very boring people. Um, one thing no one's ever said is Terence Conran, what a bore. Well, listen, um, Stephen Bailey, we have to bring it, uh, bring a close to our chat there. Thank you so much for sparing the time to to talk about Terence, and um, uh, we'll, we'll speak again soon. Thank you so much. OK, thank you, William. Bye. It's Charlie Bigham, founder of what is now the biggest independent food brand in Britain. There he is, Charlie Bigham. Welcome to Biting Talk. Hello, William. How nice to see you. I'm, what an accolade you've given us. I'm not sure if that's true, but we'll, we'll take I, it. I, I'm sure it's been, it's been written, and... Um, Everything, everything you, uh, you you read, obviously, is is, is true, as we know. Let's just deal, first of all, with this thorny issue. When you see your food put in what would be known as the ready meal section, what do you say? Because it is a meal and it's kind of ready, let's face it. What is a Charlie Bigger meal if it's not a ready meal? Help me here. What we just, our, our objective is just to make nice food. And the reason we say this is because... I think that the connotations with a ready meal are very often negative. It's like it's all about, you know, compromise, putting something in a microwave and, and you know, maybe bolting it down before in a normal world you go out to the pub and, and have some drinks or something. And, and our food isn't about that. You know, our food, I noticed in the intro you, 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 you talked about us having a factory. I have to correct you on that, William. Um, and actually you've been to see it many years ago. And I think I probably corrected when you re- corrected it. You then, which is we produce our food in a kitchen. It's quite a big kitchen, but it's a kitchen because that's where you've got to produce food. Well, it is quite a big kitchen uh, and it's staffed by people who look like they work in a very, very big kitchen. You've got a new very big kitchen in Somerset. Um, Is this just because you're being trendy and moving down to the southwest and you want to have an office on your doorstep? Why are you reaching out and employing the the good people of Somerset? Well, we, we, we opened our new kitchen in Somerset in an amazing setting um, in an old quarry uh, in Somerset, and we built it from scratch with some fantastic architects. So we have, I think we produce food, definitely in this country, in the only, um, the, we're the only people who produce food in a building which has won a REBA Architectural Award. Uh, it's a fantastic building. And we basically, I mean, we ran out of space in London, and so we needed, we needed uh, somewhere of our own. And we thought we'd moved out of our trouble, troublesome teenage years, and we deserved a, a home of our own, which we owned, rather than renting somewhere in, in, uh, as we've done to date. Now, when you started back in 1996, and um, uh, those who know you will know the story, you, off you, you, know, you quit your job as a management consultant and you drove around various parts of, of uh, you know, the Mediterranean and um, North Africa and so on, getting inspiration. 
you came back, started your business, and you decided to name it after yourself. And with great respect, no one knew who the hell Charlie Bigham was back in 1996. That took some nerve, Charlie Bigham. When you gathered with your investors or with your family, were you tossing other names around the table? Or was it always going to be Charlie Bigham? It's my company, and I'm going to I'm going to name it after myself. No, not not at all. I would never have chosen it myself. It was actually I went to a friend who, who ran a very successful design company at the time, and I said, "Look, I'm starting this business, and I, you know, got stuck with what to call it. Can you help?" And 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 he was a lovely guy and very kindly, you know, did it almost for for nothing in terms of this big job of naming our naming our business and creating and creating the, the initial branding for it. Um, and they went away and, you know, in designer designer mode, sat on beanbags for a couple of weeks and then came back and gave a fantastic presentation. Uh, and, and, and the coup de grace of the presentation was saying, and you should call the business Charlie Biggums. Uh, and so I, I said, OK, well, that's what you think. And they, there were lots of brilliant reasons for it. You know, they said, I, I actually remember part of the explanation was, you know, your surname is perfect because it's it's half of it is big and big is great and positive and the other half is ham and and that's all about food. So there's your answer. So so I followed that advice. And actually, a few, you know, I, I've got used to it now. And what I quite like about it is it does mean it gives me it gives me that sort of it gives me that moment every when I need to use it at work. If people, if we're having a debate about you know, whether we're going to change a recipe, whether it's going to taste of this or that or the other, I, I can kind of pull rank on people and say, look, at the end of the day, my name's above the door, so I'm going to make the decision here. And I quite like that. And and over the last uh, you know 24 years of business, what is your what has been your favourite dish in development that failed abysmally at retail? Oh, well, that's quite easy, actually. Um, I did, I did uh, some develop. We developed our first range of Indian dishes. Uh, we did about, gosh, fifteen years ago. Um, lovely hearing the Chutney and Mary story. What a fantastic, fantastic restaurant that is. Uh, we work with a brilliant chef, and I don't know if you you know him. Do you know Vinit Bhatia? Of course. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's a great, great chef. And anyway, he did some fantastic creative work with us. And one of the dishes we did was, or he did with us, was was this um, duck in a, actually I think it was lamb in a spicy fig sauce. It was lamb and green chili and fig, and it was to die for. But I think we sold about five. <laughs> now, there's a lot of you know chat amongst uh, you know fooders in this country and and people urging. Um, you know, their fellow man and woman to get in the kitchen and start cooking. One, one might say that we didn't have, we don't really have a proper culture unless people are learning to cook from scratch. There you are, Charlie Bigham, um, stopping, deliberately trying to stop people from cooking. Um, I mean, you're giving us delicious food, and I might say your fish pie is particularly good. You've got a very good boeuf bourguignon, but that comes with a mash. Or, um, you know, uh, the, the, uh, there's a coq au vin, comes with mash. Um, do you feel guilty about that? That actually the British people should be learning how to, you know, uh, you know, uh, peel a potato, make a mashed potato, peel a carrot. Do you know? I don't feel guilty at all, William, because I set up my business, you know, as you as lots of people do, for people like me, and I love cooking. I love food. I love everything about food, and um, and but however much you love food, everybody needs a night off occasionally. You know, it might be it might be once a week. It might be you know once a year. But everyone wants a night off. Uh, and and you know, twenty whatever years ago that it was, that the stuff that if you wanted a night off, the stuff available was absolutely abysmal. It all had to go in a microwave. It was full of chemicals. It tasted disgusting. It looked revolting. And so we, I, my my thing was well. Actually, you know, I'm busy. I was being a management consultant at the time, and a couple of days, you know, every now and again, I come home and think, oh, you know, I love cooking from scratch, but tonight it's not the night. And I want, and I thought there might be some other people out there like me. And luckily, I've discovered that there are. And most of our customers, we hear, we get, we have, you know, fantastic correspondence with our consumers. And most of our consumers actually um, are avid cooks. And so, you know, I think our, you know, our food is about giving cooks a night off rather than than saying, you know, 
stop cooking altogether. That would be a travesty. If that's what if we persuaded people to stop cooking altogether, that would be a travesty. Yeah. And um, on that note, uh, have you had a good lockdown? Have people been, you know, using you as an excuse not to cook further? I mean, obviously, if you can't, if you there's far, you know, so difficult to eat out, you must have probably uh, had a spike. Has it been a good few months for you? Yeah, I think it's been, you know, I mean, I, I'm not going to complain at all because, I mean, there are so many people who've had the most abysmal time in the hospitality. Um, and we've been very fortunate in that, you know, our business has been open throughout. We've had our ups and downs, as everybody has in this in this dreadful time. But overall, you know, our business has, has been fine. We've stayed open every day. We've been producing food. I'm sure we've lost a few customers, uh, consumers, because they're stuck at home and can't get out to the shops, or perhaps they're fearful about losing their job or have lost their job. So we've definitely lost a few consumers. But I think we've also gained a few people who perhaps, you know, have got have got fed up from cooking from scratch every night and said, let's have a night off and 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 uh, and, and have some delicious food. Because that's our motto. Our, you know, what we want to do is just make food, you know, that's delicious. We say only delicious will do is our sort of mantra. Yes. Now, um, I mentioned earlier that uh, you've been um, uh, spreading your wings. You've opened a, uh, a kitchen down in the southwest. Uh, you're also collaborating with the Wells Food Festival, um, and you're going to have a, a, a virtual festival. Um, there's going to be a Bigham's Banquet. Do you think a food festival can work in a virtual sense? Well, it's going to be really interesting. I think, you know, when we, we've been sponsoring in a small way the Wells Food Festival, which is a fantastic festival in a normal year, attracts about 20,000 people. We've been sponsoring it in a small way for well, since we arrived three years ago. And then this year we decided we'd be the lead sponsor. And obviously shortly after we decided that uh, the, council, the, the, the festival had to be cancelled because of uh, the situation we're in. But I think, you know, if you, you know, what's something I've learned in business is if, if, if you, you know, if you get knocked down, you've got to sort of pop back up and come back with something. So we said, OK, well, let's take this as a challenge and see what we can do. So we've got this uh, virtual food festival, you know, launching, which is over the 10th and 11th of October. I, I mean, what I'm really delighted with already is we've set up a kind of a, a, a website and stuff for the 140 um, small artisan producers who would have been at the festival to sell their wares anyway. They've all been having a really tough time during lockdown, normal routes to market cut off. So, so that's fantastic that we're able to do that and celebrate all of that wonderful. I just, you know, I mean, I just think that's the heart of food in this country. It starts with small artisan producers. And, you know, we started as a small business off my kitchen table. So it's very fitting. And we've got a really good lineup. As you, as you mentioned, we've got this virtual banquet. Very excited by that. Uh, we've got some really great chefs uh, lined up to do that. Um, and indeed, I think, William, you're going to be you're going to be with us that night, aren't you? I will. I think it's a fantastic idea. So well done. Thank you for mentioning that. Listen, Charlie Bickham, we must end it there. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to see you. Thanks very much, William. See you soon. Thank you very much. Okay, it's time to sate the thirsty appetites of the Farhad Haydari fan club. Uh, it's time for the biting talk in-house mixologist. For this week's cocktail, Farhad, over to you. Hello, William. Indeed, I am the biting talk mixologist and delighted to be with you again with my two-minute cocktail, which this week is a ginger spider highball. It's a wonderful cocktail that consists of three principal ingredients. Dry gin... Angostura bitters, and ginger ale. Here's how we're going to do it. In a lead crystal highball glass filled with ice, we're going to pour 45 milliliters of dry gin. I prefer botanist, a dash of Angostura bitters, and the 75 milliliters of fever tree premium ginger ale. Give that a stir, garnish with a lime wedge, and voila, that's your gin spider highball, and that's our two minute cocktail this week. Back to you, William. Thank you, Farhad. <laughs> Another great reason to drink gin. My thanks to all my guests this week, to Carlo Carello, Camellia Punjabi, Stephen Bailey, Charlie Bigham, and Farhad. If Farhad's gin concoction is a little too strong for you, let me suggest a bottle, something for this late summer balminess, a Quinta Delixa Vina Verde. It's a gently fizzing beauty from Portugal, yours for just $10.95 from williamshousewines.com. There's only one Vina Verde on there. Do have a look at it. Biting Talk comes to you with Life Kitchens. 
with their four brand new collections, a wide range of styles from ultra contemporary through to classic English. All are showcased at their Waterloo showroom, where you'll also find a 4D VR theatre, which is changing the way kitchens are designed and purchased. Customers can literally step into their designs for a full 360 degree experience with the ability to walk around, see the space open drawers, and it offers one of the most unique kitchen retail experiences in London. That's it for this week's Biting Talk. Please do subscribe, rate us, and be safe in the knowledge that Biting Talk is a front ear production. Goodbye. Goodbye.